So welcome back to another episode of How Real Estate Changed My Life. And as anybody that's listened to previous episodes, everybody that I'm interviewing has some story about how they got started in real estate and they're all unique. And the reason I'm doing these is so that I want people to understand that everybody's journey is different. You don't have to start out with tons of resources. It certainly helps if you do, but uh, there's no wrong or right way to get into real estate. So uh, today I've got Josiah was a Coloradoian and now you're a Texan and uh, you can probably talk a little bit about that story and that journey, but um, you're a client on my property management side of the business. And I got to visit with you a little bit about how you got started and what you're doing and your, your vision and how that all happened. And it was fascinating. I thought you'd be a great person to kind of share your story with other people. So if you don't mind, like, tell, tell us a little bit about you and let's, let's get going. Appreciate it, Kyle. Excited to be on here. Thanks for having me. Real estate's been, uh, it's been a passion of mine, or I, I should say an interest of mine, basically my whole life. My, my parents were very entrepreneurial. They were always buying fixer-upper properties for us to live in. They, they'd kind of create equity. I don't think that they ever really bought until recently for themselves a new house to live in. So growing up, once I was old enough to, to start helping my father out, in that at a pretty young age, swinging hammers, mostly probably in my dad's way, but he didn't make me feel that way. Mm -hmm. Carrying sheetrock, helping remodel things. Our house under my parents' roof was always under construction. It seemed like there was always a new project to be tackled, a new thing to do. And um, I was always kind of able to be a part of that. And about Probably junior high-ish, my parents, they, they started fulfilling a dream of theirs to do some investing in real estate and properties outside of their own home. And they started buying properties to renovate and then rent out. Um, they also did a couple of flips. So I had exposure to that and had entrepreneurial parents, as I said, to kind of encourage me in, in that regard. I think I was probably in middle school and my dad, I don't even know what the book was, but he had me read this book. It was full of entrepreneurial phrases and quotes and things. And then a little later in life, probably junior high, maybe early high school, he he asked me to read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And even as a, as a kid, had a pretty big impact on my mindset around money. So anyway, I'm, I'm kind of weird. My wife and I, we, when we got married, I'm married 15 years now, a uh, very supportive wife and all of this, but we were Dave Ramsey enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. And it was a blend later in life between what rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki had to say and, and Dave Ramsey, which he would say was Dave Ramsey would say that stuff's oil and water, but I think there's a happy medium there. So but what's funny is everybody quotes almost both of those authors. Everybody's rich dad, poor dad. Right. Dave Ramsey comes up a lot too. And I'm, I'm in line with you. I, I like both the Dave Ramsey. Right. I like the, you know, pay down debt, live frugal. But I love the Robert Kiyosaki on you can afford these things. You just have to figure out how to afford them in a smart way. And uh, it's an abundance mentality. And I think uh, Dave Ramsey, it's not an abundance mentality. It's not a, it's not a scarcity, but it kind of is a scarcity mindset that he puts into like almost a fear into his readers. And Robert Kiyosaki's like puts in passion yeah. into his reader, readers. Let's put it this way. I've seen a lot more rich people come out of rich dad, poor dad than I have Dave Ramsey. Like you can't save yourself to rich is a quote that, that I keep hearing. So that's great right. that you got the same, same Couldn't agree more. books and stories. So what did you do? What was your first thing? How did, how old were yeah. you? What was your first endeavor? Blessed at a young, pretty young age as an adult. I, I got married in 2008 and I think through being with my wife dating and then also uh, early years of marriage, I was always talking to her about how at some point in our lives, we're going to be doing real estate. And I was always just kind of prepping her, flipping. But anyways, fast forward about six years, I was blessed to have a, a good job for, for a while working with two really good friends of mine. And uh, rather than setting money aside for thrown into a 401k account or an IRA or whatever, my wife and I agreed that we'd start setting money as that we eventually use as a down payment on our first purchase, which was a town in uh, my hometown in Denver, a suburb of Denver more specifically. But that was in 2014. So uh, married in 2008, we, we finally took the leap in 2014, bought a town home. Fast forward a little bit, Denver appreciation, market appreciation there, that served me well. 
was able to buy a second house a few years later. Was that with new I money or was that a cash out refi? Two years later, it took. Okay. So it was it was hard earned, hard saved mm-hmm. money to get enough on the next house. But through that time, I I viewed real estate really as just what I was meant to be comprised of. I, I thought I don't want to do the stock market thing. Even that never really did. It'd be really cool if I could have ten houses. I'm 60 or 65 and have them paid off and that those would be my retirement mm-hmm. basically. And so that was even sort of, you're talking abundance mindset, scarcity mindset. I, I see now how even that was somewhat of a, I wasn't thinking big enough. I, yeah. I was just kind of going, I'll keep doing the job and that'll be how I save and that'll be the retirement thing. But still thinking about how when I'm in my 60s, that's going to be what I'm you know, leaning on. As time went on though, properties, I started just going, there's other people in the world. There are people who are real estate moguls who came from nothing. Like I came from no money, no, no trust fund. My folks, I never went hungry one bit, but there was never a ton of extra uh, yeah. for us. And so how'd they go do this? Somehow they're doing it. So I want to be one of those people to figure it out. So I started looking out of state. In 2018, I made the decision, I'm going to I'm going to come hell or high water. I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to go all in on the, on real estate and I want to scale it. And, and you did get a lot more properties. Go ahead. And you did. And you did. And this is a fun story to listen to. So how did you make that happen? Cause you're in a different state. How did you figure out where to buy and how did you finance it? Yeah. So I connected with an acquaintance in Denver who was actually buying a lot of property in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, it lit a fire under me. It was exciting to kind of realize prices out there that are a lot more affordable. Mm-hmm. At this rate, my limited mindset was, you know, buy a, buying this this way to realize there's property for cheaper in other places in the country. I could do that. So I ended up selling what I had and called those properties I did buy appreciate significantly over over the years my wife and I owned them, but we went ahead and pulled all that money out of the Colorado market that we were in. And I leveraged one sale of one house into the purchase of three in Memphis. Mm-hmm. Um, so that felt good. It was exciting to go, man, I had one now. Now I took the proceeds from the sale of that one and it's three now. Mm-hmm. And that just lit a fire under me. The the Burr model, the buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat process was something that I had acquainted myself with. And um, I thought, this is it. This is how I'm going to go do this. So I I did. I started started making trips out to Memphis, Tennessee, um, meeting people like crazy. I met a team. I got a property manager. I got uh, relationships with the realtor. I got um, title company and financing and lenders. Yes, sir. So met with local banks out there in Memphis. And all of a sudden, I felt like I have a team. I was equipped, and I just I started trying to hammer on the Burr the Burr method, and I did. And so, fast forward to today, a lot has changed. A lot to catch you up on, Kyle. Mm-hmm. Even since we've last chatted, but I've done more than 120 real estate transactions since 2018, and I don't know where that number really sits, but it's probably actually well above that now with what we're doing today. But bought properties, did them, rented them out. Went to my local lenders, got that money back, and uh, re- reused it. And I was doing that full time, or I'm sorry, as a side gig to my my job that I've had for the last 15 years. Which until recently, uh, June 30th, 2023, is the day I left the job that I never thought I'd leave. To be honest with you, but yeah. now I'm, I'm all in. I'm I bet you're you a little, little nervous and excited at the same time. That's. A good way to sum it up, man. Yeah, real, re- maybe, maybe real nervous and uh, very excited. So it's um, my business partner who you've met, Jim. We we met you and went to we went golfing. You toured us around your your neck of the woods out there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So he he and his wife, myself, we've we pulled the ripcord, and now we're we no longer have the the day jobs, and we're off uh, time doing doing real estate. And so what is so, that? What does that mean now? Just doing the exact same thing, just local? Pretty blessed, man. We're, w- what I did do with the, the side investing, in addition to my, my day job, what it's enabled me 
those properties, that endeavor for the last five years has set me up to now leverage that into the freedom to leave my day job. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a few years to get these businesses here in Texas off the ground. We, we have enough money through what I have done in, in real estate investing to kind of set us on a path to, to get these businesses off the ground. So what we've done, we've, I've moved from my home state of Colorado, moved out here to West Texas. That was a product of opportunity. We really like what, what property costs out here in West Texas. And um, in the, the tenant class, the people that are primarily renting our, our houses, we're just finding them to be quality people who, who care about our properties and are, are treating them with respect. And that's been a um, big difference from what I was experiencing in Memphis, if I'm being honest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so excited about that. So what we've done is we've launched, we've launched a construction company. Um, my business partner, Jim, he's been running a, uh, a custom home building company and also does high-end renovations in Colorado for the last four or five years. And uh, he was crazy enough to, to sunset that and walk away from that and move down here with me and go all in on this together. So we're bringing his skills, his, his knowledge to, to Texas. And uh, we're our own construction company, which is super, super helpful for all the distressed houses we're buying. And, um, and we're, we're building relationships, networking like crazy and, and trying to create a steady flow of deals to purchase on the, on the investment. So we're getting into to flips, which is not something I'd been doing a lot of, but our company needs the, the income right. from that. So we're doing that. We're our own construction company. We have our eyes set on, on following Mr. Kyle McCall and having our own property management company. It, it can be good. It can be at stressful. some point here. Yeah. It, it's a um, be careful what you wish for sometimes when it comes to property management, but it, it's a good business. Well, I'll be picking your brain more on that front. I, I'm an open book. For sure. You, you, you come to town, I'll show you everything. Uh, there's no secrets with me. I'm, I'm a pretty open guy. Like I, I want everybody to be successful. And if I figured out some equation, I'll share it. I'm a Elon Musk when it comes to sharing what knowledge I get. Cause I think it just, I'm an abundance mentality kind of guy. Love it. I love it. You're the kind of guy I want more more of those friendships. I, I struggle. I think I think some of the biggest battles are not some of for sure. They're up here. Like mm -hmm. just just overcoming mental obstacles is has been the biggest deterrent mm -hmm. to to scaling and growth for me. So abundance well, mindset is huge. Uh, and I was uh, I was visiting with a friend of mine yesterday and talking about the mindset thing is if. And this is why I'm completely open and sharing of anything I've learned on how to do anything, um, help anybody else, because that's how we all get farther. Like if I just stayed in my little circle and done my little thing with my little people, I never would have gotten any farther, but I made it a point to stretch and learn and visit with everybody I could and expand my network and ask as many questions as I can. I was very blessed to come across some good people that shared knowledge. Some of it I had to pay for, a lot of conferences, whatever. But I have opportunities now because of the people I've met and the people that have expanded my mind beyond where I thought I could be. And so if I can help somebody else do the same thing, man, that's great. Help somebody else get farther along earlier in life than I did. 100%, yeah. And there's, there's so much wisdom to be had by just learning from people who have gone before us and done it and done it, gone through all the hardship, learn what works, what doesn't work. And I really hope to be that for, for as many people as possible as well. And have, have been blessed to be able to be so, but that comes on the heels of a lot of other people that have been the same for me. And I think that's a fun commonality with real estate investors is everybody loves helping others that, that you just don't see that in a lot of other industries. And, and that's just kind of a neat thing. I think because there's, you, you know, you can't buy every house and you know, you can't, do everything at the same time. So there's, you know, I'm, I may be super hungry for houses, but if I can only pull off three, there's going to be two or three more that I saw that I just couldn't pull the trigger on. And that's how I ended up with one of my properties is because it was something you just weren't ready to pull the trigger on because you had other things going on in life. And that's how I ended up with one of my properties I've got as a rental in Haltom City. Plenty of sharing yeah. in, the, in this world. Has, uh, I've been meaning to follow up with you. Has that been a good one for you? That one. So I had a contractor challenge. Uh, so here's the thing, and, and this is good, bad, or ugly on contractors. I use, so we manage a thousand plus houses 
And so I have vendors like crazy coming to me, wanting to do work for me. And I've always got new ideas like, hey, I'm going to try this. Or I'm going to do this. I use myself as a guinea pig. So if, if I got a new contractor coming in and trying to earn my business, I have them do my properties first before I can entrust him to do somebody else's. And so I take all the punches. I take all the, the arrows. Uh, so in that case, I took some arrows on the remodel. But the thing is, is I'm still in equity. I don't, I mean, I, it, it's all fine and dandy, but uh, it took a little bit longer to get the rehab done. Uh, the quality wasn't where I wanted it to be. And I had a, a model. I was going to turn that into an Airbnb and it's, I'm trying something new where I, I mentioned that I'm doing things on me and, and, and experimenting on my stuff before I roll it out. But we're doing a room to rent model on this house. So I'm renting the individual rooms out versus the whole house at once. This house is not set up to be the perfect example, but this is the example that I have to work with to kind of work out the kinks of the system. So right now we rent each individual room out and um, I don't have them all rented yet, but I think they will be, but it should, it'll cash flow. I mean, it, it, it's a fun project. And the thing is, is there's a huge demand for affordable housing and it's shocking how much of somebody's income it takes to rent a home or even an apartment nowadays. And so, you know, there's really no stigma on a bunch of, you know, if you moved to Dallas and I moved to Dallas at the same time, like, hey, we could split a place. Well, I think today's world, people aren't as good at connecting. So they look to rent a room somewhere instead of like, hey, I'm going to call Josiah and see if he's got an extra room. Like I rented a room from a buddy when I moved to, to Dallas. So, uh, but so there's a, it's a lot bigger opportunity out there than I think people realize. And so I can rent each room out for a little bit more than I would if I rented the house. And uh, it, I'm providing an opportunity for somebody to live in a safe, secure place with a good square footage. And that place has a hot tub. I probably shouldn't have a hot tub there, but it came with one. But uh, it, it's in a great location. So it's going to be a fun project. So ask me in six months if that was a fun, good endeavor or if that was a learning lesson to not do. But I think it's going to be a good one. I, I'm pretty excited about it. I've done it on another house before and had good luck. We're going to see six months from now. Ask me. Well, I love it, man. That's a that's a model that I have a ton of interest in. And here we are, the perfect example of how uh, fellow investors can learn from each other. Because here you're going for me doing something I'm interested in trying out. So I'll learn from you. Well, there there are several big companies that are trying to do this nationwide. And some, I think they've been fairly successful and I'm like, I want a piece of my pie. I mean, you know, why, why all these big guys get to do all of it? I want, I want my piece. So I'm going to try it out, run a couple of my houses through it and then, you know, expand that model out. Give me okay. an example of a deal that didn't go the way you thought it would just because we want to share everything. Uh, I have a lot of those actually, Kyle, I could, oh. I could give. <laughs> Plenty of examples. But, you're, but that's a good thing because um, you're still doing it but, and it didn't scare you off. Yeah, I think it's perseverance. It's, you know, I, I had one of one of my early deals. This is when I was just um, wide eyed and just learning all this stuff. But I bought a property out in Memphis, one of my early ones, spent a whole bunch of money renovating it. It cost way more than what, what I thought it was going to, what, what somebody that I was leaning on to help me told me it was going to cost. Ended up um, spending probably 30% more than expected. Finally, it took, and then I'm carrying costs associated with it. Yeah. And was just on the brink of finally getting it ready to rent when a, uh, a huge rain came and flooded the basement of this house. And forced me to re- redo brand new flooring I had just put in the basement, cut about the bottom two feet of the drywall around the whole house out, uh, redo, replace that that drywall for, for two feet, replace the baseboard, repaint. So I was already getting hurt pretty bad by that one when this occurrence happened and then I got to have a fun experience with insurance and how all that plays out. But the good news there is that I still own that house today and it's probably worth uh, one and a half times more than what I paid for it back. The cool thing about real estate is I feel like if you can survive, you'll end up with a winner. <laughs> yeah. It's so, a long, it can be a long-term um, game. You- yeah. Another one, on, we're in the middle right now. We we bought a house that we figured we'd be 
carrying costs associated with the process for about five months. We are now 13 months in on that. That is still going today. Um, it's a project out in, uh, in Midland. And we had, we had contractor issues. I was still in Colorado. My business partner was still in Colorado. We, we didn't have capacity to properly, properly manage that project mm-hmm. and had contractor issues on top of that, which is somewhat to blame for, uh, we're somewhat to blame by being so remote. But anyway, we're, we're trying to sell that house now and it's not all roses. Uh, <laughs> you know, are you- we're, we're 13 months in on something we thought would take five months. Yeah. So. And something I see a lot when people bring properties to me saying, Hey, this is a good deal. Should I buy it? And they're, and they're, they're seeing all the sexy, you know, burr stuff, you know, you're buying discount, you fix it up, you rent it out and you call it. The thing is, is a lot of these people are bringing deals to me and there's not a lot of equity after the rehab. There's just not much, not enough to really justify it. And the thing they don't think about is like, well, there might be a sewer line that's collapsed. And then there, there might be some electrical problems. There, there's things that you don't see. There's all these hidden boogeymen in these houses sometimes that you have to account for. And that's why you always want to have a good equity spread between your all-in versus the ARV. Because I've seen that catch people off guard. And then it's not a good deal anymore. We kind of learned the hard way on that sort of a thing. We're, we're now implementing the, the practice of having an option period. For every property we go under contract on, we we pay the extra little bit of money for an option period, giving us the chance to back out. And during that period, we're, we're sending a plumber to camera the lines of the sewers mm-hmm. each time, just to uh, just to see if if the sewer is good or if it has collapsed, because we uh, we suffered the consequences already by not doing that, and uh, that was about a. $9,000 bill that we weren't planning for when we found out the sewer was in fact rusted out and collapsed. So yeah, there's, there's a period of time where those at a certain age, you just assume that's going to be bad if it's not replaced. And, you know, we have, I've seen those things where they've been completely rusted out, but it's been there so long that the, I guess the clay or the dirt around it is its own new tunnel. And it's still just a matter of time before some roots get in there and just become an expensive endeavor. But it's better to find that before a tenant moved yeah. in because when, when a tenant's in there or a new new homeowner moved in, then it's a different a different set of problems. And it's urgent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got one right now in, in Wichita Falls. And that one, I put the tenant up in, in a hotel for a few days while I had everything re-lan- rerun. Fortunately, it was a peer, it's a pier and beam home, which I love working on those because it's real easy. My, my plumber doesn't have to dig tunnels or tear up the floor too much he can he can work underneath the house but that gets expensive if it if it you know it's not controlled well so what are your favorite ones what are what are some of your favorite wins that you've had something you can brag about on the golf course well you being familiar with the burr Mm -hmm. burr method um just the quick summary there you know the goal with buying a house distressed doing the repairs needed on the property then placing a tenant once it's all finished finally going to a bank and and putting a long-term loan on it the goal there is of course to try to get all the capital the cash the investment back out of the house so you can reuse that money well one of the properties i did in memphis and and been blessed to have succeeded at this a few times i bought a house right right as covid was all unfolding and uh just there was so much uncertainty about life at that time, finances, the direction of the co- country, mm-hmm. what was going to happen. And I was under contract on this house, felt like it was going to be a good buy. Just kind of made up my mind that I was going to follow through with the purchase and felt like I was getting a good deal. Thing ended up appraising after all was said and done, did the repairs and everything for all my money back, but an extra $12,000 out of that deal from the bank. And, um, was able to then leverage that into, of course, more properties, but successfully burring infinitely where you get all the cash out is, is probably one of the most satisfying things. But recently, you know, we've, um, we've been doing this now really hard since buying, our goal is to buy 60 properties in a calendar year. So that's five a month. Thus far in the last six months, we, we've managed to get our money back out of each one of those purchases to the tune of 30 deals that we've done. That's an impressive, far, yeah. Just this month, and and so when I ask people, what do you like listening about to on this podcast? And they're like, I want to understand more, like real, like how the how do you execute this? I think what you just told me 
it's something everybody wants to know. Like, how in the world did you get all of your money back? So can you can you walk through one example from beginning to end as if we're I've never done one before? You bet. You bet. Yeah. So I think the real key here is being disciplined with with your numbers and your analysis. So where where I've gotten in trouble is by being lazy in that regard and, and not really putting everything into a spreadsheet and being disciplined enough to go through with a fine tooth comb and account for, for all those costs that you might anticipate or that a property is going to have. So that's one of the keys for us is Jim and I, my business partner, we're, we're being diligent to, to get into our spreadsheet. Here's a just a, a, a property that we might get presented with. We go, we think we could buy it here. Here's what the renovation is. And when it's all said and done, when we plugged in all the numbers and all the details on what that cost is, it's reverse engineered at that point. It's It went from, here's what we think we can buy it for, to now we plugged in all the numbers on the renovation and we're get, we get a max allowable offer as mm-hmm. a result of those those numbers. And so now we go back to the seller of the house and we say, hey, we know you could go somewhere else, but here's our number. Here's what we can pay you. And no hard feelings if it doesn't work for you, but here's why. And we like to share why our number is what it is. And we, we're, we're pretty open with the sellers about how we came to that number and sharing. We got to do this to the house and this to the house and all these things, they add up to this. And then we plug in our carry costs. So I really feel that underwriting is the key to a successful burr to successfully get all your your money back out. It really comes down to being putting in the time and the discipline to to account for all the costs honestly. Because when you uh, when you skim over things, you just end up with costs that you weren't anticipating. And next thing you know, you're over budget and you're not gonna. <laughs> You're not going to do that project for what you thought you were going to do it for. So um, I, that's been the key for us is, is is that is just really fine tooth comb all the associated costs and then letting what that amounts to dictate what our offer truly can be on the home. I know. And, it, and it's very done. doable. It's possible. And, and I think people don't realize that you can actually get a house that you can pull that, ex- you can execute that model on. I think too many people think, oh, well. I'm going to not be able to get it that deep of a discount. Well, you're not really getting it. You I mean you have to work for anything you get out of it. So that that's the thing. And so you you're rewarded by that equity at the end. To put that in some fictional realistic numbers, let's say the after repaired value. This is what it appraised for when it's all done, all said and done. Let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars. You know that when you go to the bank and do a cash out refi or rate and term refi, at the end of the day, once it's a beautiful home, you need it to be below. Eighty thousand dollars. Is that kind of a ballpark number that you go for? Is it even less? No, that's that's pretty valid. Okay, so then you got to figure. So that's your number. You got to work off that eighty thousand. Now you got to figure out. Well, I've walked this house. I've got a pretty good estimate that this is going to be a just make it easy number. Let's say it's twenty thousand dollars in work, and then so now you're down to sixty. What you can offer. Then you're like, well, my financing and my carry cost. If you're financing it, let's just say it's another five. So now you're from sixty. Now you're down to fifty five thousand. Fifty five thousand. And you know your closing costs, things of that nature. Let's say it's there's a let's say it's another three thousand. So now you're at fifty two thousand dollars. That's the number that you can offer. And this is real world. You can offer fifty two thousand dollars on this house. Go close it, borrow money, carry it, rehab it, pay the contractors. You're going to be all in at eighty thousand when you're done, and it's a beautiful home, back to perfect. And you go to the bank because now it's worth a hundred. So you've earned $20,000. That wasn't free money. You earned it. You go to the bank and you say, Mr. Bank, I want to do, a, I need to refinance this, get my money out of it, or just refinance the note. And then now you're, you've got a note for $80,000, which is all that you have in it on a hundred thousand dollar house. So you got 20% equity. And so you, in essence, have $0 in the deal. It's just work that you have in it. And now you got your money to go back and do another deal. So you've been, you did that 30 times. That's what I want everybody to know. So that, that's kind of the way it worked for you. You, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. yeah. And you have to be disciplined. I mean, it's so easy to pull the trigger on something and like, well, it might be 85% that I'm paying. Like I'm not, I can pay a little bit more. Like, and then that's what comes back and bites you a little bit. You just can't let it get too far yeah. away from you. And sometimes the market plays in your favor. Sometimes well, it does. 
but it doesn't always, you know, when you, you can't predict a hundred percent what the value of that home is going to be, you know, six months down the road, but you have a pretty good idea. A hundred percent. And that all of a sudden for us, you know, just six months ago, I was still working my, my, my full-time job where there's income coming in for, for my life. Um, from that job that was not real estate investing. And the same was true for my business partner, Jim. We had these other income streams where if we failed to complete the burr process to the tune of getting all of our money back, it wasn't the end of the world for us at that point, because if needed, we could we didn't like to have to do it, but we could say, hey, look, we came up a little short on this. We need to put some of our own cash back into this. And we would do that. Well, now that we've pulled the ripcord and changed our whole lives and come down here to launch these businesses and do this as an all-in full-time endeavor, suddenly those incomes that we had are gone. Yeah, and the, the only safety net. way forward is through real estate investing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the safety yeah. net is gone. And so it's all the more imperative for us now to to be disciplined, to run our numbers properly, and to truly account for all the costs that we think and then work hard to negotiate and be honest with our sellers to say, here's why we, this is our price. And, and if this works for you, this is what we'd like to buy it at. And uh, so, yeah, we're, I, I'd say, Kyle, that's probably right now what I'm most excited about is that we've been, we've been sticking to that. We've been disciplined that, and it's working. That is something to be very proud of because that, that's a very rare accomplishment. The, the other thing that I forgot to mention is the rental rate. So you got to make sure, hey, I know what it's going to rent for. And that number should cover PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance on that property, minimal. I mean, then you've got maintenance, maybe you have property management, then you've got capital expenditures, maybe roof blows off in a storm. So you got to have, you know, kind of build up a, ne- a nest egg for that. So there's, there's a lot of other little expenses that catch you off guard later when you hold it as a rental. But then there's so many benefits that we could go into about owning it. So yeah, there's a whole lot involved. And, you know, the rental rate, you know, what you rent that house for on uh, June 1st is sometimes very different than what you rent it for on October 1st because everybody's right. in, in, in their homes ready for school and, you know, nobody's out, you know, looking to move a, a full family in the middle of October very often. Yes. Yes. Timing is, is pretty key on rent rates. And we're learning that's true also for for flipping houses and, and getting good sale prices on them as well is yeah. what time of year is it? There's, there's factors that we're, we're learning. We're, dr- we're drinking through a fire hose right now on a lot of this stuff. It's <laughs> Well, you're doing a good job free. of sourcing deals yeah. because, you know, I would love to do 30 deals in a row, but my, my deal flow is not really there. I'm not, I'm not focused real heavy on it, but I don't think I could pull the trigger next week and have 30 deals back like that, back to back to back to back. I'd have to be really focused on that. So that's something to be proud of for you to move markets and still be able to pull that off. That That's an impressive endeavor. Have you noticed the markets that you're in now? So you're in multiple markets. So is there a big difference? You mentioned earlier that the quality of tenant may be different, but is there a different, like what do they like to live in? You know, is it three bedroom, one bath, three, two, three twos? Are there big yards, no big yards? Like, is there been a big difference in the what you look for in purchasing from market to market? Yeah. A lot of what's impacting this is what, not so much what our, and this doesn't maybe sound great, but not so much what our tenants want so much as what do we want as the investors holding on to these properties. Mm-hmm. And what we're seeing out here in, in West Texas is the, the you're, you're going to be shocked. Everybody's going to be shocked to hear this, but we like three bedroom, two bath ranches. It, okay. um, everybody's going to be shocked to hear that. I'm just kidding. Everybody would expect that probably, yeah. but those are just sort of a sweet spot for, they're, they're really versatile. You can get somebody that doesn't need three bedrooms, but they're happy to have a three bedroom because it gives them an extra room or it is a family and it's a family of, with four kids and the three bedrooms a little tight, but they can still make it work. So we're liking that. The rents are pretty good. It's a pretty drastic drop from, from that to a two bedroom, two bath or a two bedroom, one bath in rent value. So that's really what we've fixated on. This is something I'm loving. I'm a, I'm a really extroverted, outgoing person. So one thing I'm loving about West Texas is being in these smaller towns. 
that we're in or that I'm immersing myself in. Mm -hmm. It's fun to be known and and get to know a community and just be driving on the road and see people you know and wave and coming from Denver. um, That's not something that, you know, it's a rare day when you're on the road and see see somebody you know. Well, out here, I can't avoid it. Yeah. Well, Um, you're obligated to wave at everybody when you pass paths down the highway. That's just a requirement. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, so one thing that we're finding is as, as people get to know us, we're having some conversations about, do we want to try to have a more diverse offering of rental properties to fit the need that various people have? Because as people get to know us in these small towns, which is really fun, I'm getting phone calls from people saying, Hey, I'm hearing that you guys are doing this and you're, you're providing clean quality rental properties. Do you have something like this for us? And we're looking at each other and my business partner in the eye going, well, maybe we need to really try to buy a two bedroom, one bath every now and then, or a four bedroom or five bedroom every now and then just to kind of fit the needs that's some families do have. I don't know that I would do that if I was in a big city in Denver, but out here, it will be kind of, we're thinking it might be beneficial for us to just be able to have the options for the people who are getting to know us in these small towns. So do you find, well, there's two things. First of all, I love the small towns. I love it when I get the opportunity to run out to some of these outside the Metroplex because they have the best restaurants, like they have the best hamburgers. It's not the chains, but that's not as important as do you find the tenants are less transient in these communities? Do you think that like, for example, if you were to go get a four bedroom or two bedroom house, which in DFW may not be as attractive because it may sit vacant for a little while. Do you think that the tenant base that you have in smaller communities stay in a home for a longer period of time so that you have a shorter vacancy rate or vacancy period? I would say that it is. It does seem to be better than my experience, for instance, comparing it to Memphis, um, my experience thus far is yes. I mm-hmm. think that we're getting tenants who are s- staying in it for, for longer periods. So I like th- that about it for sure. And uh, yeah. And again, it really feels good when you get a call from somebody saying, hey, so-and-so gave me your number and said, you're the guys to talk to about a house. I'm looking for this. It's really fun to to meet those needs. Mm-hmm. I guess it feels it feels good. And if you're meeting somebody special, to. yeah, if you're meeting somebody special order, that's pretty valuable to them. And you've already got your tenant picked out in some cases, so it's kind of nice. It kind of reduces your vacancy rate. It's kind of nice. Mm-hmm. There's a private equity fund. I don't know if they're real busy right now, but I know that they were purchasing houses just like all these other big private equity firms in DFW and all these big markets, but they they were different. They didn't go buy a house, fix it up, and then put a for rent sign in the yard. They found the tenant first and they let the tenant go find the house and then they would rent it to them when they closed it. And I was like, that's kind of genius in the, you've got your tenant already picked out. You don't have the vacancy. Now, the, the challenge on that was, is they were paying retail because you know they're sending tenants to go find retail homes but i was looking at that it's kind of nice they, they didn't have to worry too much about their vacancy and who they're going to get rented it and i think they gave them longer term leases and then they had some incentive program to help them buy the house later if they wanted to so it was kind of nice in their way that they were keeping those tenants longer so if the tenant gets picked out their home they're That's less awesome. likely to go look for another home to pick out so i can see that being a benefit that is so cool i do too well, it's funny you mentioned that. I was talking to uh, your friend who I know him because of you, but Chris Kratz. Yeah, he's a machine uh, who who is helping us. <laughs> he, he's he he really seems to know his stuff. So we're grateful to you for connecting us to him. But he called me saying he's got a just a great renter in a in a nonprofit organization, mm-hmm. and it gets my wheels turning. And because I love I love what you're saying that that type of model where you. You find the tenant first and then go find a property to fit. That's an interesting approach. And, and that one, and that one, a quality that spe- tenant. Yeah. That specific situation is something that we're really, I don't know if you want to say passionate about it, but really, I just feel like I need to find somebody to buy a house for this, this nonprofit. And I've, we've managed several of their homes that they rent already and they've been amazing tenants. It's, it's a nonprofit that has they have a there's a couple that we work with one of them this one's a forgiven felons i think is the name of a freeman group and what they do is they help people transition from an incarcerated life 
into back into the world. And they they found that if you provide a better community for them and resources, they transition better and then they don't become repeat, you know, tenants to the prison system. And it it's it's a fascinating success rate that I've seen with these. And they have actually been the best tenants that we've had. Like it, it's just, I mean, it's it's wonderful. They have a really good support group. And the thing is, is they can't pay an arm and a leg for rent. I mean, you know, they have to pay kind of market rate. But the problem is where they need a house right now because they need it to be near all the other homes. The rental rate versus what we could purchase a house for is not a traditional, it's not traditionally a great return on somebody's investment. So we need somebody with a little bit of a, a vision of, hey, not only do I want a safe, good investment, that I'm, but I also want to like do good in the world and help people. And so that's who we're looking for, for for this nonprofit group is to find somebody that's got matches their passion and their and what they're wanting to do in the world and match it with a good investment. And uh, financially, there are better investments, but man, is there a better investment than investing in people? No, I love it. I think that's awesome. I, I told Chris... We're not probably presently a good fit, Mm -hmm. which bums me out. But I've got some friends who they've been working with a nonprofit in Omaha, Nebraska for sober living. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a certain criteria the nonprofit does similarly to what you and Chris had shared with me about this for, for the type of home that's a good fit. And so they go out and they specifically look for for homes like that to purchase. And a lot of their tenants end up being this nonprofit for sober living groups. And uh, it's just a really neat thing because they're they're scratching each other's back, if you will. Mm-hmm. And you end up with, it's neat and it, and it motivates me. And I, I think that we're looking for something to that effect to kind of hitch our wagons to out here. We're, we're early out here, but nothing's better than, mm-hmm. than helping people, <laughs> like you yeah. said. So oh, we'll get into uh, equity, kingdom equity there. Which yeah, is there you go. So th- yeah, there's, and there's so many <laughs> ways that you could be so helpful to somebody by something you were going to do anyway. Landlords are not evil people. And I'm going to go through my, my clientele list and I'll tell you 90% of them, maybe 80, like they are really they care about the people that are in their homes. Like they want to make sure they have a wonderful home to stay in. They want to take really good care of it provide a, not just a safe, secure home, but somewhere they can be proud to live in. And so that's a reoccurring theme with landlords because all of the landlords at one time rented probably. I mean, I, you know, I've rented in college and I rented after college and I wasn't a bad person. So, you know, and I, I appreciated landlords taking good care of the properties I was in. So just because you end up being a landlord doesn't make you evil. So there's a lot of good people out there that want to share and, and provide for other people. Agreed. I love that. You know, when you're in this world, we, well, there's so much to do with networking and, and just finding people. And when you're looking for people, when you're looking for good contractors and you start to find, when you find a good subcontractor who's going to go do some work for you and he, he proves to be good, chances are the guys that he's friends with that he can connect you with are also going to be good yep. and, and have uh, a similar moral compass and, and the desire for for similar quality and all that. And I'm just finding that that's true in so many aspects as we delve in, you know, through my journeys, I came, I met you and um, you've connected me to other people and go figure the guys that you've connected me with are also great guys Mm -hmm. and great people that we, we get to work with. And so, yeah, it's, it's like a family tree or something that there are a lot of good people doing this stuff and, and finding them and connecting is, is help us grow a lot and it's it's been it's been really meaningful it's yep. been really fun for us to make those and, friendships and connections yeah and, and you get to do it on your terms you you get you're in control of your life now i'm sure that's you still have that demand on you know performing but it's your your decisions so that's kind of nice so i can't talk forever before we wind down completely tell us something that some advice you have to somebody that's listening to this and and they hear josiah with all these wins and, and some of your challenges, what would you in, say to somebody that's sitting on the fence right now, that's sitting in their job and they're like, man, there's something I want to do. I just don't know what it is. I know it's in real estate. What, what would you tell them? I would tell them, start, mm-hmm. take the leap. That is the biggest thing. And know that success is not always about dollar signs. It just 
it isn't. Start. Take take the leap, change your life, and and start learning. Because when you take the leap, you're going to start learning, and learning is going to going to change everything for you. And you're going to, the next time you do something, it won't be as scary because you've done it once already. And then you do it again and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's an age old thing, but, but I feel like here in the real estate space, people just worry too much about all the things that could go wrong. And I'm not unique. I didn't come up with this phrase, but I sure repeat it a lot. I don't know who to give it credit to, but um, we worry too much about what could go wrong. And we don't think enough about what could go right. And uh, just have an experience and taking that step to do it, to start, to to buy the house. If you break even or even lose some money on it, I guarantee you what you will have learned will impact your journey in a way that's going to be so beneficial. So take the leap and and, uh, enjoy the ride (laughs) because it's... It is a ride. It's I, it's a roller coaster ride. I, I agree. I agree with everything you say. And that first one is scary. And there's a lot of question marks and a lot of like, it just, should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do this? What? What? And you question everything. And you pull the trigger. You do it. And then you want to do it again. And then the next one's so much easier because you're like, it's just not as scary. It's probably like the time you first drove a car. Like the first time you drove a car, you're probably just scared. And you're like, oh, there's going to be another car coming down the road. Are they going to cross over the lane or, you know, that car going to stop it? Like after, like now you don't worry about it because it's just old hat. You're good at it. You, you've been in there. You've done the reps. You're an expert. And I think it's the same thing with real estate. And uh, the thing is, is it has such a positive impact on your life and the lives of people down your family tree also. Yeah. I'm hopeful that that's going to be there. I'm, I'm pretty sure it will be, but certainly that's the, that's the carrot that hangs out there. That's super exciting about how we can change our our family's futures as well through this piggybacking. I know we, we got to cut it short, but mm-hmm. taking that step and taking that leap, I think it's it's that mindset stuff where stepping into scary and, and fear and overcoming that, I'm still dealing with it today. The last six months of my life have been tumultuous and I've been, I'd be lying to everybody if I said I wasn't really stressed out a lot, which has come with a lot of prayer and and trust and leaning on on the Lord and my family and my beautiful wife to help me get through all of this. But ultimately, big changes are on the other or exciting things and success mm-hmm. is always on the other side of hard. You know, yeah. it just is. You're never going to experience something new and massively different in a good way if you don't do something new and massively different <laughs> from what you've been doing. Yeah. And that then boils down to the mind battle. It's mm-hmm. just. How do I beat it? Uh, it will, and, and the first step's the massive step. Everything else is small after that. It's just, it's just, you're just building on top of that first big, massive step. True. That's true. Yeah. And what feels like a big, massive step, you might look back on it and see that wasn't so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so that's right. It's all, it, all the perception. Well, I thank yeah. you so much for sharing your story with us. I know people are going to get good value out of it and they're going to understand that, okay, this is absolutely possible. I just have to take that first step. It's not as scary as it sounds. And the second step is less scary. Appreciate you sharing your story w- with us. Cause not everybody wants to tell everybody how great things are and, and, or even scary, but you know, they just kind of keep it themselves. So thank you for being open and sharing with people. And the second thing is I truly expect you to come to DFW sometimes soon let me give you a tour of the the facility here and what we're doing and i'll show you all the software i'll show you everything we're doing how we set up our tenants and set expectations for them and how we market and everything so we're, we're here for you i love it i love it well we're, we're grateful for you and all that um Macaw property management has been for us with with the properties your your property you're taking care of for us there and uh, we really have. I didn't get to touch on that, but we're we're going to start buying in in your neck of the woods. All right, for, primarily for flipping, but nonetheless, yeah. it's probably not as cash flow heavy as kind of like what you're used to out in West Texas. But there's definitely some opportunities for flipping. You can make some rentals out here too, but it's not going to be the same level as what you're doing out there. Yeah, hoping to hoping to flip to create some cash, and then ultimately would love to to have a portfolio of of properties in the dfw area for holds because that it's solid town just just keeps growing kyle well (laughs) it's it's a a solid market you know maybe it doesn't cash flow like it used to but man it's not going anywhere like every time i open up the computer there's another big facility being built not far from my office and x number of jobs coming and you know we're like a magnet 
we're a magnet, it seems like, for everywhere else in the country for jobs coming here. And there's a lot of reasons why, but man, it's just, it, it's been good news for, even when the rest of the country was having struggles, we were always the light in, in, the, in the country, it seemed like, when it came to jobs and real estate, not taking the hit like everybody else. It, we've been really blessed here. Hopefully we keep it up, knock on wood, but um, I'm here for the long run. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, looking forward to doing more and yeah, looking forward to seeing you probably in the next few weeks, honestly. Yep. Absolutely. We'll be <laughs> so, here. All right. Well, thanks all right. for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you for making time for us. I appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. You too. Thank you.